you didn't already turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 19, I hope you will. But uh, before we get started, I'd like to ask you to do something. I'm going to give you 60 seconds for this. I'd like you to uh, take out a piece of paper or a note on your phone, whatever. And I'd like you to write down the names of three people who you know, three people you know who are not saved. Three people you know, friends, family, coworkers, neighbors, whatever. Three people you know who are not saved. The past several weeks, we've been spending a good bit of time talking about caring for others, treating others the way you'd want to be treated, being humble when you walk with the Lord so that you'll treat others the way you ought to be, you would want to be treated. Um, last week, Caleb exhorted us from the letters of John that we need to be people who walk in love in all that we do. This has got to define us because uh, that's who Jesus was. Mark chapter 10 and verse 45, Jesus said, The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. We're not here for ourselves. It was even prayed about today. We talk about it a lot, and we got to. We're not here for ourselves. We're here for others. because We're here because of God, and He is a God of love. Therefore, we've got to be people who serve, who give, who offer ourselves up as living sacrifices in service to others. Whenever Jesus came to serve, he didn't primarily come to heal people and feed people and to provide emotional and mental health or physical health or to reform socio-political systems, although a lot of the things he did do provide for those things. And there were often times when Jesus did heal people and feed people. That's not why he came. I didn't say the whole statement. I didn't say it correctly and fully. In Mark 10, 45, Jesus said, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And to help us understand that service, he said, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus came to serve the spiritual needs of mankind. Broken and lost in sin, destroyed and destined for eternal death, Jesus came to serve those needs, our needs. Jesus came to serve the spiritual needs of mankind. And whenever he told us about him coming to serve, it's in the context of him saying, hey, you need to be like me. Humble yourselves like me. Care about others like me. Serve like me. And so uh, we need to serve in every way we can. Providing for those who don't have food and shelter Supporting those who are broken down, weeping and mourning from different kinds of loss, providing whatever way we can. We want to serve in every way, but the most pressing way, and really the only way that will ultimately truly matter, is when we follow Jesus in serving the spiritual needs of our friends and neighbors. I asked you to write down those three names, so that as we look at Jesus' spiritual service today, that you'll be thinking about how you need to follow him as best you can, to try to serve the spiritual needs of those who are lost. I want to look at a, a couple of passages in the Gospel of Luke to understand it. Because when I say, okay, Jesus, <clears throat> we're not going to give our lives a ransom for many. We need to be ransomed. So, and Jesus knows that. So what we're doing in our service of spiritual needs to others isn't precisely like Jesus. But there's a few occasions where Jesus says, hey, here's how I went about my, here's how I'm going about my business. Here's what I came to do. And in that, he actually teaches us some really important principles that should guide the way we live our lives on the earth so that we, like Jesus, as his faithful followers, can serve the spiritual needs of our friends and neighbors. Luke 19 is the first one. Uh, here, you notice in verse uh, 10, 
It's a very, very similar passage. Remember, for the Son of, even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. It starts almost the exact same way in verse 10. For the Son of Man has come, but Jesus doesn't say to serve in this passage, although it is his service, but look at the way he describes it. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Jesus served and serves, I'll say, our, the spiritual needs of mankind in that he sought out those who were lost to save them. Jesus served spiritual needs by seeking out those who were lost to save them. I like this story so much. Um, so I like the beginning of it. It just is um, the beginning of an episode of a regular day in whatever town. Actually, it's not whatever town. It's Jericho specifically. But you notice in the beginning, the past does not begin. Jesus was on a preaching mission in Jericho to make sure that they all blah, blah, blah. The way it's described there, it says he entered Jericho and was passing through. He's going. By the way, at this period, he's going to the city of Jerusalem where he's going to give his life as a ransom for many. But the point is, he didn't have some very specific purpose to be in Jericho. And there he is passing through. And, of course, there are many people always crowding around Jesus, especially at this point where the frenzy is working up. Uh, really, they just love him to be king. They're going to celebrate him going into Jerusalem. And so there's all these people around, and Jesus is making his way through the town with the crowd, and you can imagine all the interactions and all that with him. And there's this man who, uh, I think the, the children's song is, he was a wee little man, is the, is the children's song for this guy. He was short in stature. He couldn't see. And think about this. Zacchaeus, all he wanted to do was see Jesus. He's not fighting through to be able to shake Jesus' hand or give him a kiss or ask him for something. He just wanted to see him. That's how eager he was for Jesus that he climbs up in a tree. Not the most, um, and I don't know all the uh, you know, cultural sensibilities of this people, but it doesn't seem to me as the most honorable thing to do as a grown man to climb up in a tree to try to just see another grown man walk by. But he was so eager for Jesus and so desirous, and he climbs up. And you know, I don't, I don't know about this. I don't know if Jesus was, was um, taken off guard by this, not accessing his ability to know, or if Jesus came, passed through this city in particular for this purpose to see this man. I don't really know. I'd kind of like to think it might have been the latter. That he knew there was somebody looking for him. And he was looking for him. I really like what verse uh, 5 says. There Zacchaeus is up in the tree. And it says, and when Jesus came to the place, he looked up. He looked up. And he said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry down. and Come down. For today I'm going to stay at your house. Now, everyone was scandalized by this, as you already heard in the reading. He's going to go to the house of a sinner and eat with him? And Zacchaeus, it's funny, Jesus doesn't even get the chance to say his piece. I don't think Zacchaeus had to say this. But Zacchaeus is so eager. He said, hey, look, I'm trying to help you. I'm not one of those scoundrels. Or maybe I used to, I don't know, maybe he used to be, maybe he was. It's not clear if, how much he was actually a criminal, like a lot of tax collectors were Known to be, thought to be by, by normal folks, I guess. Um, but he says, hey, I'm giving my goods to the poor. And actually, if I ever cheated anybody, I'll get four times as much back. I mean, he is real eager to repent, to change. To, In other words, he kind of knows what Jesus is all about. He knows Jesus is not about being greedy, being unjust, all that kind of thing. So he says, I'll, whatever it takes to have you in my house, I'll do it. But Jesus, I don't even think Zacchaeus had to go that hard. Because what Jesus says, is, today salvation has come to this house. By the way, the salvation was coming to the house before Zacchaeus made all those promises. Jesus is salvation. He was coming to the house. Amen. Today, salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham. I mean, he's a person of faith. He's a person seeking God. And this is who I came for, Jesus says. My whole life, my reason for being here is to serve the spiritual needs of mankind, which means I'm looking for fellas like this. Fellas that may not have a lot of respect in the eyes of the world. People who everybody else may think of as a real crook and criminal and a bad guy. That's who I came for. The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. I guess part of my point with the story is, how dramatic was it that Jesus uh, sought him out? What I mean is, was Jesus going door to door in Jer Jericho? Excuse me, I'm looking for Zacchaeus. I heard he's lost. I heard he was the tax collector around here. We need to get those guys. No. Jesus was passing through, but he looked. He looked. Everywhere he was, 
day by day, he was looking for those who are lost. All right, how can we serve spiritual needs like Jesus to seek and to save those who are lost? We need to look, y'all. We need to look. When I asked you that question a second ago to write down the names of three people who are lost, I hope that that was a pretty easy thing for you to do. Actually, I wish it wasn't easy. I wish it was really hard for you to try to think of somebody. But, but we know the Lord said most aren't following him. I hope that was easy for you to do. But I wonder if for some of us, we'd be like, huh, who do I know who's lost? I'm not really paying attention to any, whether they're lost or saved. I don't really know what's going on with people. You understand what I'm saying? We need to be looking, y'all. And I don't. And by the way, it's cool to, to knock on doors when we can or go try to just find people in parks or in cafes or whatever. That's good, too. But the way Jesus found Zacchaeus is he just looked up when there was a funny grown man in a tree. That's how he found him. It wasn't some big project. And similarly, there's people all around us every day if we would just... Look. And what that means is we've got to develop the kind of compassion of Jesus. The compassion that drove him to leave heaven, to come to earth, to look for us, and to look for people that were not very nice to be around. I know Jesus was kind to the sinners, but you think Jesus just enjoyed one second of his life around people living in sin and evil and darkness all the time? The, the joy that he had was the joy that was set before him in God. But he had compassion on us. When he saw people like us, he saw people like sheep without a shepherd. And so he said, i got to go track them down as the good shepherd. i got to go find them. And wherever I may be, I'm looking. Where are they? Where are the people? Of all those people in the crowd, Jesus didn't go to one of their homes. And I'm not saying that all of them weren't seeking God like Zacchaeus. Maybe they were, maybe they weren't. But it's notable to me that Jesus says, there's the man. I looked and I saw him. He's looking for me and I'm seeking people like that. We need to be seekers, y'all. Seekers of seekers. You understand what I'm saying? we got to be looking up to see the people who might be willing to listen to the Lord. And I'll tell you, in terms of a practice, I mean, that's sort of a disposition. That I'm a looker. I'm a seeker. I'm paying attention to who is lost and who needs the Lord. But in terms of a discipline, a practice that would help us to serve spiritual needs like Jesus is to pray. And I know you're like, dude, it's always, pray is always the answer. And I know that. But specifically on this, it really is. Go check out the end of the book of Ephesians sometimes. In Ephesians 6, the armor of God passage. The way it ends, he says, put on all this armor with all prayer and petition, praying at all times in the Spirit. And he says, pray for me also, that I may open my mouth with boldness. In other words, he says, when we're thinking about the lost, it's going to come with constantly praying about them. In Colossians chapter 4, and verse 2, he says, let your speech always be seasoned with grace. So that you may know how to answer everyone and consider, you know, uh, uh, pay attention to how you deal with outsiders. How do we do that? He says in that text again, praying that God would give us this sight. We need to be prayerful so that we would serve spiritual needs of others, seeking the lost like Jesus did. Go back to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, and I'm looking at verse 49. This is another one of those um, mission passages. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Listen to this one, starting in Luke 12 and verse 49. I have come, mission statement. Here's what I came for. You ready? I have come to cast fire upon the earth. And how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to undergo, and how distressed I am until it is accomplished. Do you think that I came to provide peace on earth? And we say, I thought there was a song about you that kind of said that, so I thought so. <laughs> no, Jesus says, I tell you, but rather division. For from now on, five members in one household will be divided, three against two and two against three. They'll be divided father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother-in-law. And daughter-in-law against uh, daughter... Oh, boy, sorry. Mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Jesus said, I have come to serve the spiritual needs of mankind. And the way I'm going to do that is by busting up families, burning this place down. That's how I'm going to do it. Okay, is that... If somebody said, how did Jesus serve our spiritual needs? Is that the answer you would have given for how he did it? So how does this fit into this? Everything Jesus did was to ransom us, to serve our spiritual needs. But here he says, I have come to cast fire upon the earth, to divide households. What is this? How is it? All right, let me, let me walk us through what I think, what I th how I think we should understand this. 
this, this image of fire is an image of judgment. Go back to John the Baptist preaching. That's what he said about the Messiah. He's coming to baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire. And the fire is coming to burn down the, the, the chaff, to separate the wheat from the chaff. So this is judgment language. We don't love it very much. But Jesus came to pronounce judgment on the world, on the ruler of this world, Satan, and on the ways of this world. And he did that through his, what he said, but he also did it through what he did. Everything that he did and said demonstrated that, hey, the world y'all are living in, the world y'all have built, the world that you are participating in, it's awful. And I'm burning it down. I have come to burn down this world to build up the kingdom of God. Because y'all are just sick. You're destroyed. You are lost in this world. And I'm coming to show you a new way. I think perhaps was referencing our prayer earlier today. I'm showing you the way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one can come to the Father except through me. So let's burn down. Let's cast fire on the earth and all the evil that's here. Uh, so... We're like, you know what? This is good. I've been waiting for a passage like this from Jesus because I've been looking to burn down some folks for all the bad stuff they're doing. So, awesome. And if that's you, then I'd refer you to James and John. The same disciples, by the way, who didn't get the fact that Jesus came to serve, not to be served. In Luke chapter 9, there was an occasion where Jesus was passing through some towns and there was some Samaritan villages that rejected Jesus. We don't want you here. Get out of here. And James and John said, Lord... Do you want us to cast fire upon these cities? They're like, it's time, baby. Finally. I hate these guys. <laughs> and Jesus rebuked them. And he said, you don't even know what spirit you're of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy people's lives, but to save them. All right, so now I'm confused, Jesus. You said you came to cast fire. We offered to do your bidding and cast fire of punishing these people who are doing wrong. And you're saying we're misunderstanding you. So what, what, how, what does it mean that you came to pronounce this judgment, to cast fire on the earth? You know, in another place, in John chapter 12, Jesus used very, very similar language. It starts around verse 31. He said, For judgment I have come into this world, and the ruler of this world has been judged. This system is not working. This is bad. This is destructive. This is not the way to live. That's Jesus' judgment. And he said, And when I am lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. What is Jesus talking about there? What was the great act of judgment where Jesus demonstrated, where Jesus lit a fire in this world that said the world and its ruler are the worst? Don't live this way. Come in God's way. What was the moment when Jesus was lifted up to light the fire on the earth. It was in his cross. It was in his cross. We read verse 49 and we think of uh, Jesus enacting some act of violence upon others. But actually the way Jesus cast fire on the earth, the way he judged this world to be evil and wrong and broken and useless and give up on it, turn it away, like just let go of it, the way he issued that judgment was not by enacting violence upon the world, but by taking violence upon himself on behalf of the world. And actually, I didn't have to take you to John 12 because look at verse 50 right here. We haven't talked about it. You notice the parallel statements. The end of verse 49, he says, I wish it were already kindled. And the end of verse 50, he says, how distressed I am until it is accomplished. Almost the exact same idea, same word. In verse 49, the thing he wishes were accomplished, uh, excuse me, that he wishes were kindled is the fire. This judgment. The world is not working. You've got to get out of this thing. He's condemning the world. But in verse 50, it's not a fire that he's distressed about or eager to be accomplished, but it's his baptism that he will undergo. And in other places in Scripture, that baptism is the reference to his death, his sacrifice. He was baptized in the fires of sin and darkness and evil in this world to show us his way is greater than ours. Because this world took a man who did nothing his whole life except tell the truth and work hard and serve the needy and love God with all his heart, soul, strength, and mind. He did nothing except that. And in this world, we took him and we beat him down 
And we hung him up and we shamed him and we rejected him and we hated him. And in that, Jesus was lighting a fire to say, look at what you guys are doing. You reject pure goodness. You reject the glory of God himself in the flesh because of your ways. Stop. Go a different way. Jesus came to serve our spiritual needs by casting fire of judgment upon the world and its ruler and its ways to show us that this is not working. Now, how does that work for us? Well, do you remember what Jesus would always say to folks? Matter of fact, there's a parallel passage to this Luke text in Matthew chapter 10, and it's one of the many places where Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wants to come after me, if you too want to serve the spiritual needs of your fellow man, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. I'll refer you to the book of 1 Peter to, to, that further, I think, um, details this. But the lives we live in our marriages, in our workplaces, in the way we treat those who mistreat us, in the way we handle our, our sexual temptations, the way we think about money, in the way we think about work, in the way we think about society, all of these things, Jesus says, crucify. Live, as the Apostle Paul says, such that the world is dead to you. It's been burned down because I've taken up the cross of Jesus. I don't believe it anymore. And you know what people are going to say whenever you say, oh, you know what, I, I would love to go to that uh, holiday party with you, but honestly, man, everybody's going to get way too wild, and I don't run in a flood of dissipation. If you want to quote scripture, that would be wild. But I don't want to run in a flood of dissipation with everybody. I'm so sorry, I can't go. And they'll say, are you judging us? And you'd be like, well, I mean, I'm not really trying to. I'm just, tell, I'm just following Jesus. And actually, I kind of like, you guys know, I liked doing that stuff with y'all before. But I can't do that anymore and because I've taken up my cross to follow Jesus. And, and by the way, don't shy away. If they really force you to be like, listen, it's not me that judges you. It's the cross of Jesus Christ. If they force you, you don't have to leave with that. But if it comes up, it comes up. You know what I'm saying? And that is, and I'm not saying, again, I'm not saying that we walk around puffing our chest at how much better we are. We bow our knees before King Jesus. And that will issue a judgment on this world. Whether it's in negative terms like that or in positive terms. As you're a gracious, forgiving person. As you're not running the same race that everybody's running in your workplace. You're behaving in a totally different way. Thinking in a totally different way than everybody else. The way you talk about money. The way you talk about politics. is so strange. And they say, why do you keep doing this? It does seem better, but it's not the way I live. And it seems like you think you've found a better way. You say, well, actually, as a matter of fact, I have. Because Jesus Christ came to cast fire on my old world. And he burned it down in the blood of his cross. And he brought me into his new heavens, in his new earth, in the kingdom of heaven, in the kingdom of God. That's where I'm living. Amen. And I'm thankful that he served my spiritual needs. And you know what? You could follow him like I'm trying to follow him too. Maybe we could help each other. Why don't you take up the cross and follow him? Amen. Jesus came to serve spiritual needs by judging, casting the fires of judgment on this world through his cross. And we can do the same whenever we... As 1 Peter says, following Jesus, do our good deeds before men in such a way that they may glorify God. Go back to Luke chapter 5. Jesus came to serve our spiritual needs by seeking to save the lost. Seeking the lost to save them, I should say. Jesus came to serve our spiritual needs by casting fire on the earth through his sacrifice in the cross to show us the better way. Listen to this passage in Luke 5, verse 27. we got another tax collector situation. After that, he went out and looked at a tax collector named Levi. Jesus, always looking. Just like he did with Zacchaeus, he looked at a tax collector named Levi, sitting in the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. And Levi left everything behind and got up and began following him. Just wild, by the way. You're at your job. It's not a great job, but it pays the bills. People don't really like you for it because you're taking their money because you're a tax collector and you're a turncoat because you're most likely a Jew working for the Romans, so nobody likes you. And you're sitting there just collecting taxes, doing, doing your duty or whatever. And, uh, and then this rabbi comes by with his you know, little posse of fellows that walk with him everywhere he goes. Maybe you've seen him around town sometimes. I don't know. And he stops in front of your booth. You think, uh-oh, I've heard about this guy's sermons. He's going to kill me. Yeah, I'm sure he hates me too. And instead, he looks at you and he says, follow me. 
And then I guess just kind of keeps on walking. I don't know. It doesn't sound like much conversation past that. And Levi does. I don't know if Levi had heard Jesus' teaching. I don't know if he had begun to love Jesus otherwise. I don't know if he was just curious. I don't know if he just had realized his way was not working and he needed something different. But whatever it was, he, shockingly, he got up. And notice what does the text say? He left everything behind. His life, his identity, his job, his source of income. Potentially, although we'll, not, we'll see maybe not, not fully, but potentially friends and all kinds of things. Left it all to follow Jesus. Verse 29, And Levi gave a big reception for him in his house, and there was a large crowd of tax collectors and other people who were reclining at the table with them. The Pharisees and their scribes began grumbling. And I love this, by the way. Pharisees were not that brave. They didn't grumble to Jesus. They grumbled to Jesus' disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? What are we doing here? I thought this rabbi was great. I'm confused. What are we doing here? And Jesus, and I don't know if Jesus answered because the disciples just shrugged their shoulders and like, honestly, we don't really want to be here. I don't know if that was it. I don't know if they didn't know the answer. I don't know if Jesus said, you know what? Y'all were actually asking me, so I'll answer. Jesus answered and said to them, it is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous to repentance, but sinners. Jesus came to serve the spiritual needs of mankind by calling sinners to repentance to follow him. Jesus called sinners to repentance to follow him. I mentioned earlier about Jesus, us needing to learn to have the compassion of Jesus to see people. And here this helps us a little more because we need to learn to, like Jesus did, to see people properly. Jesus didn't see people as irritants or combatants he didn't primarily see them as enemies, although certainly he must have known many of them were his enemies. What did Jesus see when he saw tax collectors and sinners? The dirty, rotten people who had lived in ways, and frankly, no doubt, were living in ways that Jesus himself would have found utterly repugnant, more than any of us could ever imagine. Jesus was God in the flesh, the holy, holy holy God, whose eyes are too pure to look upon evil. That's Jesus Christ. And then he comes into this world and he's sitting at table with people who were greedy, who were sexually immoral, who were hateful, who were racist, who were you fill in the blank, whatever, all the stuff. Jesus sat there at that table. But he didn't sit there like I might have sat there thinking, dude, when can I leave? When can I go home? Will these people please stop talking that way? Would they? That's not how Jesus sat there. When he looked around, he saw people who were sick, diseased. And he knew that he could do something to help. He could do everything to help, unlike any of us. He saw people with compassion. He saw people as sick. And so, like any good doctor does, and some of us are very annoyed with our doctors very often because of this, but like any good doctor... Jesus called them out of their illness, out of their sickness. He told them the remedy. He told them the cure. To leave everything behind, everything in that world that he was coming to burn down because it wasn't working anyways, he said, leave it behind and follow me. That's what repentance is. Repentance isn't necessarily always making restitution. Some sins we can never restore. All of us have sins that we'll never be able to go back and fix, to undo, to make right. We never can. But that's not the call anyways. Zacchaeus kind of thought it was, remember? I'll pay that out. Listen, that's not really the whole deal here. Repentance is to turn away from that life, that direction, that path, to follow him wherever he leads. And by the way, sometimes we get the opportunity to make some restitution, and that's wonderful. But sometimes we don't, and it's all right. Because Jesus said, hey, you're sick, and you can't undo all the illness from the past, but I can undo the illness now, and I can eradicate your disease forever. If you just come and follow me. Jesus came to serve the spiritual needs of mankind by calling sinners to repentance, to follow him. I have two thoughts about how this should impact us and our relationships and those list of names that you wrote down earlier. We need to do the same thing. We need to call people to repentance, to follow Jesus. 
Now, I guess that's going to show up in different ways, but I'll tell you one way it could often, it, I think, could often show up is you got a friend and they're complaining to you again about how bad things are in their home or how bad things are emotionally for them right now or how they're feeling after another breakup where they just were, well, living like everybody in the world lives when it comes to uh, dating relationships, sinfully, I mean. You know what would be great for you to do next time? Is say, are you happy with the way your life's going? And if they're honest and they're able to say it, they're like, no, why are you making me feel worse about it by asking me? I don't like that question at all. Then call them to repentance. You know, man, I have hard days too, but honestly, I don't have any days like I used to because I follow Jesus now. If you want to know more about him, I could tell you about him. You should follow him too. You understand, the call to repentance is not us scolding people. I think sometimes we think in those terms. That calling people to repentance is scolding someone because of all their misdeeds. I'm not saying we shy away from talking about misdeeds. You've got to acknowledge the bad. Jesus didn't say these, these are really good people. They're just a little, they got, they got a little sick. No, Jesus called them sinners. So don't shy away from being honest about, hey, you know the reason why your life isn't going great? is because God made you one way and you're trying to live a different way. So you really should try to live God's way because he's the one who made you in the first place. we got to talk like that. But that's calling people to repentance. And you understand the point. Jesus didn't say, how dare you? You disgust me. And they walked. That's not, that's not what he did with Levi. Although no doubt, the sins that Levi committed were, I know this because I read the words of Jesus in the Old Testament when he was with the Father, that the sins of mankind do disgust God. And yet, whenever Jesus saw Levi... He didn't emphasize that. He didn't say that. He said, hey, follow me. And as he followed him, he told him the stuff he needed to hear. And he challenged him and he rebuked him and he corrected him. But the point is, come follow me. We need to call sinners to repentance. And I really want to encourage you to be more bold. Bold with humility. Bold with compassion. Bold with empathy. But bold nonetheless. You need the Lord. You need to follow him. This is why your life's messed up. You don't have any hope. I don't care how much money you get. You're still going to be bummed out. doesn't matter who wins the election in 2024. None of them are really going to be that good, especially compared to Jesus the King. Be bold to call sinners to repentance. Because I'll tell you what, I can be somebody's friend. I can listen to them. And God forgive me for times when I've done this. Just listen to them and be nice to them. And they're like, man, that guy is such, he's my good friend. He listens to all my problems and he cares about me. And never called him to repentance. Never told him what could actually help. What good is that? What have I done to salve someone's emotional trauma or whatever the case may be if I don't tell them the real salvation, the real healing that comes from following Jesus? If we care about our neighbors, and we must, y'all, because the Lord cares about us. We care about people around us. You care about those names on that list. You need to be praying and looking for and trying to figure out ways to call them to repentance. Not to scold them or just make them feel bad for badness sake. But to say, hey, you really need to follow Jesus. And you know what? Some people will be like Levi and hop up and leave everything. Most people won't, so don't get discouraged about that. You did your duty, and who knows? Maybe down the line something else will happen. I'm going to say one more thing just briefly about this before we wrap up one more text. Um, Jesus did this sitting down at the table. Well, I mean, not, I guess technically he did it walking by his workplace at first, but then he immediately went to sit down at the table with Matthew, with Levi. Same guy, different names. He went into Zacchaeus' house. You can't call people to repentance from a distance. You've got to get in there. You've got to get in there. You've got to listen. You've got to care. You've got to walk with people through their darkness, through their pain. And that doesn't mean you go hang out to have fun. You know, sometimes people use this passage to be like, be like oh, are you, you want to drink it with your friends? Like, oh, yeah, yeah. You know, Jesus, uh, Jesus went out with tax collectors and sinners and stuff too, you know. It's like, yeah, to preach to them. And by the way, they weren't really people he wanted to hang out with. You just want to hang out with this person. And fortunately, Jesus kind of sort of gave you a little excuse for it. That's not what this passage is about. Jesus went because he kind of had to, to be able to help them. We need to be people. No, so that, sorry, tangent. Back to the point here. We got to get in there with people. We got to sit down at the table with those who are sick down in their souls. All right, last one, Luke chapter 4. Jesus didn't come to be served, but to serve. To serve the spiritual needs of mankind. And Jesus did that by looking for people, seeking to save those who are lost. We need to be looking, paying attention, praying that God would show us those who are lost. 
Jesus serves the spiritual needs of mankind by casting fire of judgment on the earth through his own sacrifice in the cross. We take up our cross so that people will see this world and its ways do not work, that we can light more fires right behind Jesus that burn down the ways of this world and the ruler of this world. Jesus came to serve the spiritual needs of mankind by calling sinners to repentance to follow him. And here's our last one. I'll go ahead and tell you the point. Jesus served the spiritual needs of mankind by proclaiming God's good news. Luke 4 and verse 16, it says, And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And the scroll of Isaiah the prophet was handed to him. And he unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. This is the first event, at least in Luke's uh, narration of Jesus' ministry, of Jesus' ministry. This is how he launched out. It's no accident that Luke records for us what Jesus read. Because this is the mission statement that sums up all these other mission statements. Jesus came to serve. And look at all. Serve the poor, the captive, the blind, the oppressed, the one who has not received God's favor. That's who Jesus came for. But you notice it doesn't say, I came to give a bunch of money to the poor or to run jailbreaks up and down Judea. He's not talking about those kind of, that kind of poverty or that kind of imprisonment or that kind of sorrow. He's talking about the soul poverty, the soul imprisonment, the soul blindness, the spiritual blindness that we have because of our sin. And how is he going to do it? How is he going to help? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Read the rest of Luke 4 on your own time. Almost every sentence talks about Jesus' uh, preaching. Matter of fact, at the end of the story, a bunch of people gathered because they wanted Jesus to do some stuff for them. And Jesus said, actually, I'm going to the other towns. So, Whoa, there's a lot of people that need you to heal them or feed them or whatever. And Jesus said, we're going to the other towns because I must preach the kingdom there also, for this is what I came to do. Jesus serves our needs by proclaiming the good news. And I guess this is kind of related to being bold about calling people to repentance. I just want to ask you, are you proclaiming the good news to those names that you put on uh, that note earlier? Have you proclaimed the good news to them? You might say, I'm not even sure exactly what to say or whatever. Okay, great. So let me tell you how to do it. How did Jesus do it right here? With these group of people, how did Jesus, who if anybody could off the cuff proclaim the good news, it's Jesus. But how did he do it? He grabbed the scriptures and he read them. I want you to think about this past week. Have you recommended anything to anybody? A book, a TV show, a movie? Anybody done that? Have you recommended the scriptures to anybody? What I mean is somebody has a problem. And you say, you know what? I don't know if you read the Bible, but there's actually a scripture that talks about that. Why is that weird? Does that feel weird to you? Like, oh, I don't know if I can do that. That seems a little strange. It's not weird to say, hey, you should watch this nerdy TV show that I like. Or you should read this book that nobody's ever heard of. That doesn't feel weird to us. Why would it feel weird to just say, hey, here's a scripture that I think might help you, actually. If the person rejects it, okay, that's up to them. That, I didn't, I'm not saying you've got to force them or trick them into it. Just proclaim it. Offer the scriptures to someone. How about this? When would, have you recently, and I bet you have, said, dude, I found this new restaurant. We've got to go. Hey, there's this great coffee shop. You need to try it out. Oh, hey, I'm going to this game. Or I'm going to watch the game. Why don't you come over and let's watch it together. You invited somebody to do it with you? So here's what's even better than recommending the scriptures to someone. What about if you said, hey, I read the Bible. Um, and I, I've been thinking about some of the things you've been telling me. You've heard me. I told you you need to follow Jesus. Um, you've asked me why I live so strangely. You kind of feel judged by the way that I'm. And I tell you it's because I follow Jesus. And... Um, I was just thinking we could read the Bible together if you'd like. Let's just get together and read it and we can talk about it. Invite them. Invite them to read the scriptures with you. Now, by the way, the scriptures aren't the good news. Exactly. But the good news is only found in the scriptures. And if you're like, I don't quite know how to word it, tell it, explain it. Great. 
Just do what Jesus showed us to do right here. The one who came to serve the spiritual needs of mankind opened up the scriptures and read it to people. Why don't you do the same thing? What if one of those three people whose names you put down, what if you just ask them, hey, and here's a great way to do it, by the way. Somebody's going to say, yeah, you know, I love the story of the birth. I'm not a Christian, but I love the story of the birth of Jesus. Everybody's talking about that right now. Y'all know? It's, it's happening. And, uh, and they say, my, I think my favorite part, though, is the three wise men. And then, and don't be a nerd about it, but you'd be like, actually, did you know there weren't three wise men? Be like, wait, what? There are three wise men. You'd be like, it doesn't say three wise men, actually. It just says wise men. Have you ever read the Bible before? No. No, I never really have. I just watch the TV shows and stuff. You know what? You should check it out. Would you want to read that sometime together? Try it out. Let me know how it goes. I've never tried it before, but it might work. So. <laughs> Jesus came to serve the spiritual needs of mankind, and he's called us to follow him and do the same. We, like he did, have to be people who are seeking the lost so that they can be saved. We, like him, have to take up the cross and in taking up the cross, light the fires of God's judgment on the devil and his ways in this world to show people there's a better way. We need to follow Jesus to call sinners to repentance, not to scold them, but to tell them, hey, your way is not working. It's sin. Jesus is the way. Follow him. And we're only going to be able to do that if we open our mouths, if we proclaim God's good news like Jesus did. It's the last thing I'll say. All this, I think, is well and good and important. But if you're sitting here and you've not allowed Jesus to serve your spiritual needs, then all this stuff I'm talking about, that's what you need first. You need to hear the good news and believe it. You need to repent and turn away from your way and your life and follow Jesus. Be baptized. He went through a baptism that washed away the world's ways. And he calls us to be baptized so that our sins will be washed away, so that we'll become new creatures in him, so that we won't be lost, so that we'll be saved. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for serving every need we have in our spirits, in our souls. Teach us to be faithful followers of Jesus and to serve the needs of others to serve the needs of their spirit, to serve the needs of their souls, to serve their eternal needs. And Father, please continue serving ours. We need your ransom. We need your salvation every day. We pray that you'd strengthen us so that we'll be able to see you and you'll be able to say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.